I'm excited to have be quiet soon. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation because all of you who are on the phone know this is a critical time. This is a critical time for women's rights. And we're going to talk about five recent Supreme Court decisions and not just what they decided, but how it affects you and everyone, and particularly how it affects our work. It affects all of our pillars, reproductive justice, uh, economic empowerment, and violence against women. So we got a big agenda, but it's an important agenda. Um, I do want to make a couple of cautionary notes. I know what's happening in the election is on everybody's minds, given what has happened in the past couple of days. I just want to remind people, we can talk about the issues, but given that we are 501c3, we will not and cannot talk about the candidates themselves. So as much as you might want to have us do that, we can't. Just a reminder. So we're going to start off. Uh, Azalea, our legal director, is going to start off. Then Lynn's going to follow. She's the director of the National Judicial Education Program, known as NJP. And then Sahar, our deputy legal director, will follow. From a formatting perspective, they, after each case, we're going to leave a couple minutes for Q&A. So put your Q&A in the, in the chat, and then we will try to answer as much. So after each case, we'll have Q&A. And then at the end, if we have time, we'll try to answer more questions. Uh, and at the end, I'm going to tell everybody, what can you do? What's the call to action? So stay to the end. I'm going to tell you what can you do. So without much more ado, take it ahead. Azalea. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Appreciate you being here and your support and your interest in these very critical issues. Um, like Carol said, I'm going to um, discuss a couple of cases that the court heard this past term um, that significantly impacted um, access to reproductive care. And um, I, you know, the court has has had a very busy term. There's been a lot of issues that it, it heard, but I'm just going to focus on um, the reproductive care cases. Um, you'll hear from Lynn on um, firearm access by uh, domestic abusers. And then Sahar will discuss um, some other matters that we did not sign amicus briefs on. Yes. But we're gonna start with um, couple, with some of the cases that we did sign um, briefs in support. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, the Mifepristone case and uh, MTAL, uh, the Emergency Medical Treatment and uh, Active Labor Act. So, um, and I will preface this by saying that in both, um, cases, the court issues issue decisions not on um, the merits of the case, but on procedural grounds. And we can talk about that and what that means. Um, we're going to start with the FDA versus the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine. And that was the um, access to the abortion pill case. And in that case, um, you know, which had a very long and tortured, uh, you know, procedural history, which I won't bore you with the details of, um, essentially, anti-abort, anti-choice doctors brought this case with the goal of taking away access to medication abortion, which um, is, I think, accounts for about over 60% of, uh, of procedures in our country today. Um, and the case involved the FDA's approval of this medication, um, which was approved in 2000. Um, so, you know, it's had a very long history. Um, and it's not only used um, to terminate pregnancies, but it's also used to, um, to manage miscarriages and treat uterine fibroids and other reproductive health conditions. So this is a this is a medication that's been in use for you know a quarter of a century. You know, the FDA has you know shown time and time again that it's safe, it's effective, it has you know very low adverse effects. Um, but in the wake of Dobbs, uh, when you had um, you know these extremists emboldened by by the overturning of Roe, um, you know this newly formed group decided that they were going to take on this fight and try to strip access. So um, they challenged the FDA's approval of the drug, um, you know the initial approval in 2000, and then some other um, other changes. Um, that the FDA enacted in terms of who can prescribe it and um, you know, and up to what time in pregnancy. So initially it was seven weeks, 
then, and I, I think it was in 2016, um, they, they, they lengthened the time that in, under which it could be prescribed, so up to 10 weeks. So, um, you know, this group of doctors said, we don't like this, we don't agree with it, um, and we're going to challenge it. And the Supreme Court, um, you know, said, essentially, they don't have standing to bring this case. So they didn't rule on the merits of the case. They just said that this group of doctors um, did not suffer an injury, in fact, in order to bring the case. So, you know, um, while this is certainly good news at this time, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that going forward, you know, with with better plaintiffs who will have standing that challenges won't be brought. Um, so, you know, this is something that we should all be concerned about because um, the the issue will be vulnerable to other challenges. And um, I think some of you have seen or are aware that there are three states, um, Idaho, Kansas, and Missouri, who um, already have these challenges in, you know, forthcoming. Um, and additionally, um, there's a lot of movement on this issue. Um, you know, states are, are really trying to to test to see what they can do to limit access um, and to make it harder for people to access um, you know abortion medication. In fact, Louisiana just recently changed the classification of mifepristone um, to a um, a controlled substance, much like you know, I think in the same class as heroin, so that um, if if people um, are in possession of it without a prescription, they can face the you know serious criminal penalties. So, um, you know, while this is certainly, um, you know, the Supreme Court's ruling in this case is um, good news for now, it is temporary. And again, I just want to stress that it was it was you know dismissed purely on procedural grounds that these doctors did not have standing. So, with the right plaintiffs. Um, you know, the case may be heard on the merits and they could have a very different outcome. So um, I think it's- a question in the chat? That's what you want to do, Azalea? Sure, if there's any questions about that, um, I'm happy to, to discuss it. Oh, we have no questions in the chat, so you can just go ahead. Okay, um, great. So I'll move on now to um, another case involving uh, reproductive care. And this is the case called Idaho versus US, um, otherwise known as the EMTALA case. Uh, EMTALA stands for Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, which was a law that's been around since the Reagan administration. So it's, you know, it's over 40 years old. And it is essentially, you know, our country's only um, guaranteed right to health care. Um, and it was it was passed in the wake of hospitals dumping patients who were uninsured or underinsured. So you would have patients across the country show up at emergency departments, and you know because they couldn't pay, hospitals would refuse to treat them. So um, this law was passed saying that any hospital in this country that uh, receives Medicare funding, federal funding has to provide stabilizing care to patients who present at, um, at hospitals. So we have this, this promise of EMTALA, which says that you know, you're guaranteed a right to get stabilizing care. However, EMTALA um, kind of collided with Idaho's law around abortion. And Idaho has a very um, strict limitation on the procedure, it bans all abortions with criminal penalties of up to five years in prison for anyone who performs or assists in one. Um, so there, and there are exceptions for rape and incest, um, which as Lynn and I like to say are kind of bogus exceptions because by the time you're, you know, done reporting into law enforcement or getting a rape kit, you know, the time in which you can access the procedure may or may not be available to you. Um, and they also have an exception to save the life of a patient, but there's no exception to protect the health of a patient, not even when that um, patient is at risk of organ failure or loss of future fertility, or there's some severe grave risk to the health, but not necessarily the life of the patient. Okay. So, um, you know, 
Amtala says that these hospitals, that the hospitals must stabilize the medical condition of someone presenting at the emergency room. And when you have a pregnant patient presenting with a severe um, health condition, such as pre preeclampsia or um, a very, you know, uh, severe episode of hemorrhaging or, or having a seizure or having a stroke because of this high blood pressure that's happening. Um, and the only stabilizing treatment is to terminate the pregnancy. You know, you had cases where um, women were literally sent out to parking lots to bleed out until such time as their uh, condition was in such grave risk of death that, um, you know, physicians could provide that stabilizing care. Um, so in that case, the court said that, um, you know, their initial accepting of the case was um, was prematurely granted. So, you know, even after we had oral arguments on this issue, um, they still they still decided not to decide at this time. So, you know, while it's good news for now that, you know, Idaho cannot uh, enforce its ban and, you know, people can get the stabilizing care they need, um, the issue is still not really resolved because all across the country, in so many states that have these restrictions and bans limitations, this, this conflict is still there. And, and pregnant patients don't know if they're going to get the stabilizing care that they need um, should they need it. And so, you know, it is really shocking that we are, you know, in 2024 discussing and debating whether or not a patient can get stabilizing emergency care when you present to a emergency department across the country. Um, so in both, both these cases, um, you know, underscore how the Supreme Court did not, um, seize the opportunity to undo the damage that was done in the in the wake of re the reversal of Roe. So, you know, they had an opportunity to um, to make things better. And, you know, unfortunately, they they just didn't. And um, I think in in uh, in the Amtala case, Justice Jackson, in her dissent, um, you know, she had some really um, scathing um, things to say. And I think one of the lines that really struck me was when she said, storm clouds loom ahead. So she knows, she sees what's happening. She's foreseeing that this is not gonna be the end of it. This is not the last time the court will hear these issues. Um, and this was a squandered opportunity. So it's clear that you know she's aware that this decision by the court leaves the door open um, you know, for, for it to come out a different way, for, you know, for them to affirm Idaho's interpretation of EMTALA and to end emergency abortion care, um, you know, whenever the court hears the case again. So um, I think that, you know, both of these cases highlight how important it is and how urgent it is that um, we continue doing the, the work that we're doing around reproductive health care and access. Um, and, and also, you know, empowering the medical community to provide the care that they you know, went to law school to be able to, I mean, excuse me, to medical school to be able to provide, um, you know, uh, to, to really allow them to, to practice the profession that they, that they went to, you know, medical school to do, like, um, you know, to actually, you know, abide by the Hippocratic oath. Um, so I think it's, um, it's something that we should certainly continue to, to watch out for and monitor, um, you know, in the coming months um, and years. Um, I think it is, you know, every, everyone should be concerned, not, not, you know, not only if you have a uterus and can become pregnant, but really <laughs> anyone, because this is, you know, we're walking down a slippery slope here. You know, uh, we never thought that we in a, we'd be in a position where 50 years of, you know, um, you know, stare decisis of settled jurisprudence would, would ever be overturned, but it has. And this certainly leaves the door open for, you know, other rights that we have held dear and have assumed we, you know, we will have um, could be stripped away. Um, for example, you know, IVF, we see what's happening there. Um, and it is possible that, you know, access to contraceptive contraception, um, you know, could be, could be jeopardized. Um, I think it's, it's really um, critical that, that we see not only um, 
the angle of reproductive justice, but also how it intersects with our other work around gender-based violence. Um, Lynn and I just did a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago about um, the intersection of uh, reproductive coercion and domestic violence um, and access to um, reproductive care. So, you know, pregnancy and postpartum periods are times of increased lethality, where we see a lot of, uh, unfortunately, you know, fatalities occur. Um, and to to restrict access to reproductive care in, you know, um, considering the challenges that survivors are already facing um, is really, really just shocking and uh, tragic. So um, I know it's 317, I'll, I'll leave it um, there for now. Um, and I, I, see, think I see on the screen, somebody, Kay has her hand up, but I don't know if she put a question in the chat, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, I know you're gonna go on, but I, I think, I hope people are paying attention that you know these some of these cases we think are narrow, but they have such broad implications. I mean, who would think about connecting you know survivors and domestic violence because of reproductive issues? It, it is just bigger than people want to know, and that's what we do. That's what we follow. That's what we advocate for. That's why we do this work because we can see the bigger issues, and we have to try to tackle it. So. I think we'll yeah, and, and and Carol, just to piggyback really quickly, you know, we already have a maternal mortality crisis in this country. Like where the, you know, um, U.S. maternal mortality is 10 times higher than any other rich country, 10 times. And for um, black women, native women, low income women, um, it is even worse. Um, and with these uh, with these bans, these limitations, we're seeing, you know, providers leaving these states with these um, with these bans and limitations. So we're just going to make it, you know, <laughs> even worse than it already is. Okay, there'll be some time at the end as people digest it. Every time we sit around the table, we just shake our heads and we want to put our heads down, but we know we have to keep fighting. You know, can't leave this, you know, this, this country with fewer rights than I had when I was growing up in the 60s. It just can't happen. It just can't happen. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sahar and Sahar, let you can. Uh, I know you're going to speak to two cases. Do you want me to go? I think Lynn was supposed to go first. But oh, I'm, I'm sorry. To go. I'm sorry. I'm out of order. No, Lynn, I'm out of order. Lynn, you're on. But you're on, you're on mute. You're on mute, Lynn. Lynn, Lynn, you're on mute. There so, you go. Okay. Well. I am the person who's going to inject a note of cheer into this very serious and sad discussion because I'm going to talk about a case that actually came out the way that we hoped it would. The case is United States versus Rahimi. This is a case about protecting battered women, but in a sense, it's a case about protecting all of us because we know from extensive research that batterers do not confine themselves to harming and killing the woman they love. They also kill their children, family members, friends, law enforcement. And then we have tr incredible data on who is shooting people in uh, massacres at large, I'll call it that way. Most of these guys have a history of domestic violence. So the issue in the case was whether a 1994 <coughs> federal law, I'm sorry, did someone say something? No, no, go ahead. Um, uh, it was a um, challenge to a 1994 federal law that barred individuals who were subject to civil domestic violence restraining orders from owning firearms. And was this constitutional under the Second Amendment? Now, the plaintiff, Zaki Rahimi, he really did us a favor because he is so spectacularly dangerous that there is no way, I'm serious about this, this case could not have gone any way other way. They had to figure out a way to do something about this guy because he assaulted his girlfriend in a parking lot, threatened her life if she told anybody, shot at the guy that he observed someone was watching him. Um, and subsequently, um, he was, um, he was involved in, I'll try to compress this, but it's such an incredible um, re resume. He was involved five different shootings having nothing to do with domestic violence. 
So in, in fact, one of the commentaries that was very amusing to read was, we knew this case was gonna come out a different way, but the question was, how are they going to get there? Now, why were people worried about how are they gonna get there? When Zaki Rahimi um, um, appealed his, cause he'd been arrested for, uh, excuse me, unlawful firearm profession, possession. So he started this appeal and in the middle of it in 2022, the Supreme Court decided a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. So this is a six to three decision and you knew who, you know who the six were, you know who the three were. Um, and Justice Thomas wrote the opinion and in it, he completely turned around the way that gun law cases are supposed to be decided. He ruled that it's not a question of looking at how well this law protects public safety. This law has to comport with what he called consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Now, basically what that means is that if there wasn't a law against it at the founding in 1791, you cannot legislate against it in, in 2024. And this case, this Bruin case has really turned the courts upside down. Uh, one judge in the Ninth Circuit actually gave up his lifetime appointment. He said, I, I can't function under this way of doing things. So you, legal momentum, uh, a lot of work that we do has to do with gender-based violence, protecting domestic violence victims. And we joined a brief which argued that this rule, this law was constitutional under the Second Amendment because it's true that at the founding, the Second Amendment guaranteed white male property citizens the right to bear arms. There was always an exception for people who were perceived to be dangerous. And we said, if anyone is dangerous, it is Zaki Rahimi. And there was a wonderful moment in the oral argument where Chief Justice Roberts actually said to the lawyer who was arguing for Rahimi, you don't have any doubt that your client is a dangerous person, do you? So eight to one decision, and I'm sure you know who the one was. Um, the Chief Justice, in his opinion, he wrote, since the founding, our nation's firearm laws have included provisions preventing individuals who threaten physical harm to others from misusing firearms. He said, it's not necessary to have a twin law between 1791 and 2024. The Second Amendment is not trapped in amber. An analog will suffice. Justice Thomas, who was of course the one, he said, the court and government do not point to a single historical law revoking a citizen's Second Amendment right based on possible interpersonal violence. So um, quickly, Justice Sotomayor, who was joined by Justice Kagan, she wrote under the, under the, excuse me for one second. She wrote under the dissent's approach, the legislature of today would be limited not by a distant generation's determination that such a law was unconstitutional, but by a distant generation's failure to consider that such a law might be necessary. Now, I'm sure at the founding, we all know that nobody was thinking about domestic violence, but we know that it was rampant. Um, Justice Jackson said, who is protected by the Second Amendment in a historical perspective? And she wanted to know, why are we giving so much respect to a law that only benefited white male property citizens? So a critical aspect of this Rahimi case for, for legal momentum and NJEP is that there are many judges and other people, law enforcement and so on, who don't understand why do domestic violence victims use the civil justice system? Why are they going in and getting orders from a civil court? Why aren't they going into criminal court? Because we don't think anybody should have to give up his guns unless he is found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal court. So these individuals, these organizations, they simply don't 
get it that if you've got to go as a victim of domestic violence into the criminal court system, you have to, you know, get law enforcement to take you seriously, judges have to take you seriously, juries have to take you seriously, and A, they probably won't, and B, if they do, by the time that case goes through the system, and this is not hyperbole, this woman and her children may be dead. So we were very, very pleased that Rahimi came out eight to one, let's protect uh, victims of domestic violence. But where is Rahimi going to get this? Get us, excuse me, in efforts to promote public safety. Well, in June, um, Azalea was mentioning the bum stop case. So Justice Thomas published a 63, 63, 623 uh, opinion. He struck down a federal ban on bump stocks. Now this is a gun accessory which enables a semi-automatic rifle to fire like a machine gun. It's the weapon that was used in the worst um, mass murder, shall we say, in US history. This was in 2017 in Las Vegas. Um, guy in a hotel shooting up a massive, a massive festival, a uh, music festival, excuse me, 60 people died, hundreds of people were injured. Um, then let's look at Minnesota. Minnesota has and had a long history of very thoughtful laws promoting public safety. Well, just in July, the Eighth Circuit, and that's where Minnesota is located in the Midwest, um, they ruled that under Bruin, Minnesota's ban on 18 to 20 year olds obtaining a permit, a permit to publicly carry a handgun is unconstitutional. Now, National Judicial Education Program recently published a curriculum for judges on teenagers and domestic violence. And we did a lot of research on the teen brain. And we know that Far from nobody has a mature brain at 18 or 20. And there are a lot of people who seriously think we don't have a mature brain till our 25 and, and it's 35. So I wondered whether in the arguments that were made, did they raise this point of what does neuroscience guide us in, in this? Well, I found out that they did argue that, but to no avail. Um, the director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law said, the court's ruling highlights how much the historical focus shifts courts away from scientific evidence about brain development. And I looked up um, what the take on the group currently sitting on the Supreme Court is on offenders who were 16 years old when they committed murders, life imprisonment, no opportunity for parole. But Previously, there was some attention by the Supreme Court to the neuroscience development. Um, that's gone by the boards. Now, we also had in June a very important event when the United States Solicitor General issued an advisory on firearms. He declared this is a public health crisis and his announcement, the advisory includes this language, Ensuring that domestic abusers are prohibited from possessing firearms is essential to saving lives. Nearly half of all women murdered in the United States are killed by a current or former intimate partner. More than half of those homicides are by firearm. So Rahimi came out the way, right way. Of course, we're very pleased, but up against Bruin and the confusion in the courts that that has generated, we just don't know how positive a development that will turn out to be. Wow. Well, you said it was going to be positive, but... <laughs> well, I tried. I, we, we I did. You tried. One air quotes the case. You know, I we just have tried. to look at the bigger picture, right? That's right. All I right. just wanted to also, chime in with like a little bit more negativity. <laughs> that's fair. always what we need. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to kind of point out that we're we're kind of going down a very concerning ideological path in terms of the Supreme Court's thinking about fundamental rights. And I think one thing that's worth noting is that this notion of history and traditions was not just used as the basis to decide the Bruin case, um, to analyze 
the whole Rahimi case, but it was the reason to overturn the right to abortion in Dobbs. So it has very widespread reach in the fact that the court is now looking back to our history and traditions um, at a time when we had slavery, at a time when so many of the populations that we are really working to protect their rights were completely disenfranchised. And so we really need to be very vigilant about how the court is evolving this doctrine and thinking very much about our, you know, what our judiciary looks like, because we need to kind of really move away from the pathway of history and traditions in terms of determining fundamental rights or assessing kind of what the Bill of Rights, how it should be interpreted. Um, that being said, it was very good to see that the court in Rahimi had a, a really um, bad person at play that really motivated them to narrow it to look not at just kind of um, exact comparisons and instead to really focus on analogs. Well, Justice Jackson actually overtly called on the course court to um, do something about Bruin. Um, and, you know, maybe she'll win the day on that. <laughs> All right. So, Hare, you want to go on to your cases? Sure. I just want to check there are no questions. So kind of along this line of just really thinking about how widespread the court's reach really is, um, I think this past um, session really drove home the fact that there were certain cases that directly touched upon the work we did, reproductive rights, access to guns for domestic abusers. Um, but then there were a number of cases that really were more tangential, but have a huge impact on the work that we do um, from different angles. And so I want to highlight two cases in which we didn't submit amicus briefs, but where there was a notable impact on our work. So the first case is City of Grants Pass, Oregon versus Johnson. And the question at the center of this case was, does a local or ordinance that was in place in Grants Pass, Oregon, that prohibits camping on public property violate the Eighth Amendment prohibiting cruel and unusual punishment? So I, I know on the surface, it's kind of like, what does that have to do with our work? But what we've seen is that while cities have had a really hard time coming up with sustainable solutions to homelessness, um, at the same time, we've seen a rise in these types of laws that are really um, cracking down on um, homeless encampments and, and unhoused communities um, across the United States. Um, and this has a direct connection to our, our work supporting survivors of gender-based violence. And, and I'll touch more about on that in a minute. Um, so the facts and thinking about like what this ordinance looks like, the ordinance bars the use of blankets, pillows, and cardboard boxes while sleeping within the city. It imposes a fine for doing so. Um, it imposes fines that can go over $500 if unpaid and then can result in banning individuals from the city if those fines are not paid. And then um, it results in a conviction for criminal trespass that can result in further fines and jail time. So. It was challenged as effectively making it a crime to be homeless in the city based on the Ninth Circuit ruling um, that held that the imposition of criminal penalties for sitting or sleeping outside by people experiencing homelessness um, and people who don't have access to a shelter was cruel and unusual punishment. Um, the Supreme Court, in a Gorsuch opinion, held that the ordinance does not violate the Eighth Amendment on grounds that the ordinance regulates specific conduct and does not go, you know, specifically to um, penalizing or prohibiting homelessness. Um, in his opinion, for the court course, is stressed that the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment has generally applied only to methods of punishment rather than to whether the government can criminalize particular conduct. So the broad impact here is what Justice Sotomayor drives home in her dissent, which is that for anyone who understands the reality of homelessness in this country, there is no way to view this decision other than as permitting lawmakers to criminalize homelessness because it, is, it punishes people for as little as sleeping in public with a blanket to keep themselves warm if they have no access to shelter. Um, in her dissent, Sotomayor stresses the scope of the homelessness problem in America. So to give you a sense, in 20, 
2023, according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, there were approximately 600,000 homeless individuals on the streets on any given night in the United States, um, and even more families who are kind of on the verge of uh, um, losing their housing. She also recognizes a host of origins of homelessness, um, including crippling debt, stagnant wages, domestic and sexual abuse, physical and psychiatric disabilities, and rising housing costs coupled with declining affordable housing options. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people like to think of homelessness as something that is something people are choosing to become potentially because of just mental disabilities that can be hard to overcome. Um, that is not all of what we're dealing with. And I think we need sustainable solutions for any category um, of homelessness. So the decision has broad implications for unhoused populations across the country. And where it touches directly upon our work is that it essentially disproportionately harms some of the most vulnerable groups, including women of color and survivors of gender-based violence. According to the National Center on Homelessness and Poverty, domestic violence is the top reason women find themselves unhoused. Among unhoused women, one in four cite domestic violence as the primary reason they became homeless, and the risk is even greater for non-white women and members of the LGBTQIA plus community. And what we know from our work, day to day work is that when individuals are unsafe at home, they often have to flee from an abusive partner or situation as a result of those dynamics. And we see a large number of unhoused survivors due to lack of adequate shelters. Um, we see a lot of that in New York City, New York State, where we do a lot of work, but across the country. The criminalization of unhoused individuals further compromises the safety of survivors, creates further barriers, and it further isolates survivors from seeking assistance and, and getting the assistance that they need. So, what we'll, you know, even while we're not thinking necessarily, it's not the first thing that comes to our mind. Um, when we look at the outcome of this case for legal momentum, what we see is that it directly puts survivors at much greater risk. Um, and I think. Um, it has significant implications for our work as we continue to focus on ways to increase economic security for the most vulnerable women, including women of color, immigrant women, and survivors. And I think one of our current priorities was and, and continues to be and almost has more urgency now is really identifying modalities to provide cash assistance and different housing assistance to survivors to address many of the urgent needs, including housing. So we want, you know, we are very focused on trying to find ways to empower and support um, survivors economically so that they have the ability to sustainably escape abusive situations and relationships. So that's the first I mean, case. Um, they want to talk yeah. about any questions? So here, I'm just going to jump in and say when I was representing survivors for over a decade, um, housing was, I think, probably the number one issue that that um, prohibited people from leaving. You know, it's so it's so easy to be like, well, why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you just leave? Why why did you stay? Because because there was nowhere to go, because the shelters were full, because they didn't want to be in a shelter where their their safety, their physical safety, could be at risk. Um, and so, you know, it, it it is very easy to you know victim blame and say, well, you know, she should have left. But the question is, when you have these logistical barriers every day of, you know, where am I going to go? Who, where am I going to be housed? Where am I going to children going to be housed? Where, how are they going to access school? Where are my doctors going to be? Like my kids' community? You know, it, it just impacts so many aspects of people's lives. And I think that, you know, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation so we can really connect all these dots, you know, like the firearms access, the lack of housing, the lack of, you know, bodily autonomy. Like if, you know, with these bans and restrictions in place and this lack of housing, you're forcing, you know, survivors to remain in these very unsafe situations, you know, maybe, you know, forced to carry a pregnancy to term that, you know, would, would make them un even more unsafe because as we said earlier, pregnancy and postpartum periods are times of increased lethality and with unfettered access to firearms, you know, I mean, we, it's very easy to go down this this horrible rabbit hole. And, you know, I, I you know, I really um, thank all of you for willing to, you know, to share some time with us this afternoon to talk about this and think about this.
Yeah, and Azalea, you're absolutely right. I think something that's at the, always at the forefront of our minds, but not at others, is that survivors are the ones who are most impacted, most harmed when these rulings come down because their choices become so narrow, right? There are so, so many narrow. forms of coercive abuse that happen with pregnancy or reproductive decision making that make it really difficult for survivors to escape um, an abusive relationship. Like you said, it's the same with housing. And we have one client that we're currently representing. Um, you know, she was in an abusive relationship. The abuse escalated and she, you know, overnight had to leave her housing situation and enter the shelter system with her two young children. Um, and I think we sometimes don't appreciate what that looks like. I think that decision alone was hard enough to make. But if you think about having to do that um, without the options of having adequate shelter, or, you know, you have the option of going out into the streets, you know, and there are many women who are riding subways at night or in public transportation in parks with their families all of a sudden. Um, and the idea that then we're going to criminalize them or, or, or essentially impose fines on them for doing so is, is ludicrous. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, I'm sorry to jump in again, but yeah. when, when you touched upon the criminalization piece, um, I think it's also worth mentioning the criminalization of, um, you know, pregnancy outcomes in states that have these limitations and bans, um, the surveillance and the criminalization that, um, you know, survivors can be subjected to, you know, um, is, is, is yet another factor that they have to consider when determining how they're going to navigate their situation, you know, um, you know, there are cases where, you know, women have been, um, you know, incarcerated because of a miscarriage or, or, or charged criminally because of a miscarriage. That's what, that's the state of what's happening in our country right now. Yeah, no, and Azalea, that also makes me think of just, you know, you you talking about Imtala and the fact that our Supreme Court couldn't kind of come out and just say that, um, women have the right, should have the right to, um, emergency health, care to to safeguard their health um it really ties into the work that we do um on trying to address drug testing and reporting of, of pregnant women just the fact that you know women are now going to their medical providers they're being surveilled they're being drug tested without their knowledge and consent they're being reported to child protective services even in in so many cases where they're really saying that we didn't do what you're suspecting of us um, and in those cases, what we really see in talking to women across the country is this notion that like women, when they go in for medical care, especially, you know, obstetric care are, are not treated as whole individuals in the way that a man can safely get treated in the United States, which is that you are treated as a only a partial person, because at the end of the day, the hospital is following this checklist in terms of, you know, are you pregnant? Could you be pregnant? And then all of a sudden, half of you is gone. You know, the, those those medical protections that apply to everyone else in the United States are out the window. It doesn't matter. You don't have privacy. You, you know, you don't have your rights are signed away because at the end of the day, the hospital um, many hospitals, medical providers are trained to think that they can just now, you know, they're treating the fetus. Oh, yeah, let, let's be clear. Point. Let's call it what it is. Like women, you know, in certain parts of this country are treated as second class citizens. I mean, it's 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 what's happening. Yeah. You know, they're they're being discriminated against with this drug testing. They're being discriminated against by not getting stabilizing care. You know, it's it's ludicrous that we're even debating this. That if you can go to an emergency room knowing that you're going to get stabilizing care. Absolutely. Right. I'm looking at the time. I think you have one more case to hear, right? Okay. Yep. And this is a big one. Um, it's, it's not on the most exciting issue, but it is on an issue that um, has profound impact. So the second is actually a set of cases, Relentless versus Department of Commerce and Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo. Um, is this was, these were Robert's decisions. Um, the cases involve a challenge to a federal rule issued by the National Marine Fisheries Service that was an attempt to regulate overfishing in the herring industry. So again, how does this touch upon our work? It touches upon it very directly. Um, the question at the center of this case was whether executive agencies or courts are best settled, are best suited to settle perceived ambiguities in federal statutes. So the decision, and I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing about it and talking about it, it overrules the court's prior precedent in a 1984 case called Chevron versus Natural Resources Defense Council, um, which establishes the doctorate doc or established 
the doctrine we refer to as Chevron deference. Under this doctrine, where there was statutory ambiguity at the center of a dispute that Congress had not addressed directly, courts were required to defer to the executive agency's interpretation of the statute as long as it was reasonable. The Supreme Court's new ruling shifts this interpretive power from the federal agencies we have long relied upon and gives this power to courts to settle ambiguities or to interpret federal law. According to Roberts, the Administrative Procedures Act, which is kind of at the heart of this, directs courts courts to decide legal questions by applying their own judgment, finding that agency interpretations of statutes are not entitled to deference. Although agency deference was first established um, to give deference to a Reagan era EPA interpretation to ease regulation under the Clean Air Act, it has since been used to really build upon the institutional knowledge and technical and often scientific expertise of agencies that carry out the day in and day out of implementation of statutes and uh, that are in question. Because federal agencies are staffed with experts working on the issues in their area of focus, they are typically better suited than courts to clarify the ambiguities and to interpret the application of federal law. So strangely enough, as we kind of shift that power to the courts, as we're seeing just more and more power shifted over to the courts. Um, it, it's becoming many of these, it, they're always political questions, right? We see the agency interpretations shift under each administration, that's true, but there is more of a fluidity to that than with a court coming to a decision um, in a particular case, interpreting a particular statute, there's something to that that is in one way more um, concrete and unmoving, which is of concern. And then the second piece of that is that it's going to result in chaos because courts across the country, depending on where cases are going to be heard, are potentially going to be coming up with contradictory, conflicting interpretations of statutes. And we're going to be left, you know, similar to what we have with Dobbs. It's just this lack of clarity regarding um, or pieces of, of legislation that we need clarity on. Um, the decision is significant. Um, as I think Justice Kagan said, in one fell swoop, the court has given itself exclusive power over every open issue, no matter how expertise driven or policy laden involving the meaning of regulatory law. Um, and so, you know, the question is how does this impact our work? The ruling has direct and significant impact on our work. Legal Momentum has long used the federal regulatory process to shape agency interpretations of federal law to ensure gender equality. And now many of our wins at that level are at risk. Um, and we're likely to see an erosion of critical protections at the federal level. And here are just a few examples. So the EEOC recently issued regulations on our you know, long fought and won Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. We had commented on the proposed rule, the EEOC, EEOC issued its final rule that took into account many of our comments, especially on the need to safeguard the rights of those seeking broader reproductive health. So, you know, when we think about what a reasonable accommodation is under um, the PWFA, does that extend to abortion and other pregnancy outcomes? The EEOC rightly said yes. Um, the EEOC's rule has been now legally challenged by conservatives, a number of conservative states, it might be 17 or more. Um, so we're likely to see a rollback in the interpretation of the PWFA. That's just one regulation. The EEOC recently issued guidance on sexual harassment in the workplace, which we submitted comments on in partnership with Futures Without Violence and Legal Aid at Work. Our comments focused on the need to include protections for survivors of gender-based violence. However, we also broadly supported protections based on gender identity and sexual orientation based on, on Bostock. The EEOC's guidance has also been legally challenged by conservative states based on its broad treatment of sexual orientation and gender identity. And so these questions will now be up to conservative federal judges to decide um, instead of the EEOC interpretations. The same pattern applies with respect to the Department of Education's regulations interpreting Title VII, I mean, I'm sorry, Title IX, Again, we commented on those as well, um, looking to support transgender students as well as, as pregnancy, pregnant students. And so we're going to see likely a rollback there as well. Um, 
so there are no back more... seems to be the theme like rolling back mm -hmm. going back we're not moving yeah. forward we're going back and we're rolling things back and taking stripping rights away and stripping um power from federal agencies to to do their work um and really yeah. giving, the court is giving itself more power well, well that's that's true yeah i mean but the thing you, this is really a parallel between chevron and these brewing cases and mm -hmm. judges are not happy about this because at least, you know, I've read some thoughtful commentary. I am not a historian. I cannot possibly be the right person to be deciding this case. Similarly, the kinds of cases that you're talking about, Sahir. And I can tell you that even in Rahimi, although we're happy the way it came out, there has been a lot of criticism of uh, Chief Justice Roberts and the, case, the uh, uh, laws uh, that he chose to rely on. Uh, and very, um, very highly respected historians writing and saying, that's not what these laws stand for. If you had come to us, we would have told you, you could find something that was a little better. But um, we're really creating this crazy situation where judges have to become historians and they have to become expert in highly technical areas. And it's not that people shouldn't have the opportunity to turn to the courts if they feel that they should, but to be um, sort of blatantly dismissive of people who have deep expertise because they've been working at this for years, um, it doesn't help anybody. Well, I, I'm looking at the time. I'm looking at the time, so um, we could stay here. Okay. Yes, we do have one question. Um, will having the Equal Rights Amendment enshrined make enough of a difference to empower and support survivors? So I want I, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, we 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 hope so. Um, I think that the fact that we have it on the ballot is is a victory in and of itself because there were legal challenges to us even actually being able to proceed to that. Um, I think we have done some research and, you know, we think that having this protection enshrined in the uh, state constitution would certainly protect, um, you know, women and, and other protected classes, you know, uh, against discrimination by the government, whether it's based on age or disability, um, you know, there, there are um, other protections that have been expanded now through the ERA um, proposal. Um, I think it can um, certainly support the idea that um, the government will have to be more responsive to survivors, um, whether it's through law enforcement or, um, you know, whether it's through a state program to, um, you know, support a survivor's economic stability to get, um, um, you know, I think that the ERA will get us um, intermediate scrutiny of barriers placed in in um, survivors way in terms of accessing supports and services. I just wanted to chime in to just to build upon that. I think one thing to clarify is that we are, I don't think we're making much progress on a federal level ERA. And I think one of the key takeaways from a lot of these court decisions and, and that's impacted the direction and the work we've taken, it, it was kind of something that preceded the decisions as well, is that because it's been so hard to make headway at the federal level with many of the types of protections we want to see in place, we have been working very hard to enact state level, local level protections. And that's where we're seeing huge progress being made, really innovative um, legislative solutions crafted both to, you know, on the full spectrum of the issues that we work on. I think um, as Azalea was discussing, the New York State ERA is something that we believe very strongly to answer that question is critical. You know, if, if we can't get a federal level uh, constitutional amendment, there is a chance to get state level constitutional amendments to make sure that there is a right to gender equity in our state constitutions. That's going to be on the ballot in New York State in, in this upcoming election. And it's something that people need to be aware of in, in other states in terms of what's happening with the, the efforts to get um, equal rights amendments passed at the state level. Um, and and it's, it's absolutely critical. So that's a good I mean, segue. Let's no, we gotta that's a good segue into the call to action. What can you do? We've said we make a lot of 
progress and a lot of going backwards at the state's level. We really need you to connect with us because that's where we lay out the laws that we're advocating for. And then we will tell you, this is, this is where you need to go. This is, the, this is the legislative body you need to be reaching out to to get these laws enacted. That's what you can do every day. So connect with us on social media. We send out our element actions. We tell you, this is what's happening. This is what's happening in your state. This is what you can do. And obviously, call to action. I don't even need to say it. Vote. <laughs> you know, I don't need to say it, you know, but I'll say it. Vote, you know. And of course, continue to support organizations that are doing this work. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's sad to say, obviously, we're working hard. We're working very hard. But, you know, when as much progress as we make, when you get into the phase we're in of rolling back, rolling back, it means that we have to use all the things in our power. We lead, we litigate, we educate people, we advocate, and we defend. And right now, we're using everything in that lead to do the work we do. And it's really hard. And we come in here every day, and you know, and then someone calls our helpline. We go, oh my goodness, we got to take this case, you know. We say, but we can't. We go, but we must, you know. The, the, I'm always talking to them about capacity because we have a small team. But it's 357. We, we have like two minutes left. Azalea, if you wanted to say something to close out, um, again, this is going to be, it's been recorded, so you can listen to it if you really want to know the names of these cases that we, we said so quickly, you know, and thanks for people taking notes, but they're on, you know, it'll be up there and, you know, just continue to support is really important. Uh, and, and we really, have, we, we, as you can tell, our passion is, is hard to contain. So Azalea, did you, you had something you want to close out, legal director? Well, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think we need to look at all these cases together. Like, you know, it's important that we, we, you know, look at them individually, but I think what they're telling us together, collectively, where is the court going? What, what do we, what can we expect going forward? Um, I think that is really important to kind of synthesize these issues and see how they impact our, our clients and how they impact really everyone here, um, our families, our communities. You know, this has real life impact on the ground. Um, and so I, I, again, thank you for your time and support. Um, I also wanna make a plug for our helpline. If, um, if you have, you know, anyone in your life that could, um, you know, benefit from talking to one of us about any of these issues, please feel free to refer them to our helpline. It's on our website. We have a bunch of resources on the website, um, which are, are very, very helpful and comprehensive, you know, for, um, you know, issues um, people are facing across the country. Um, and again, um, you know, just well, reiterate. Well, what we say, is, uh, what, is our, what is our tagline? The best way to protect women and girls is through the law. That's our tag. So thank you, everybody. You know, keep pushing. Connect with us. Keep supporting and vote. Thank you all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.